want to start out with a scripture, John 1, 12. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were not born of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So the only reason why I'm able to stand here before you today and share some amazing testimonies of what the Lord has done um, recently down in Bolivia is because of this truth right here. Because he chose me before the foundation of the world to be born, not because my parents wanted a baby, not because my mom looked good to my dad, but because he wanted me. By the will of God was I chosen. And the same is true for every one of his children. You get that? We are his children. The ones that he looks upon, the creator of the universe. So what I have to share, just know that if nothing else, I pray that what you take away tonight is that you are beloved and chosen and special and have a purpose and a destiny, not because of anything you've done or could do or will do, strictly because that's who God made you to be. And he chose you for a reason and a purpose that only you can do on this earth. Only you can do it. Goodwill that he has ordained for you and you alone. So um, I'm going to share a few of the the things that um, he ordained me to do here recently. Uh, I was... Well, this, is my, this was my second time to Bolivia. I went to Bolivia the first time in 2017. Um, as many of you know, I have a handbag and accessory business, and we give a portion of our sales to Out of Darkness, it's an Atlanta-based ministry that rescues women out of sex trafficking. And then we train and hire those from um, broken and difficult situations, including those that have been rescued out of sex trafficking. Um, And so because of that, the Lord made a connection with another ministry down in Bolivia, and it's called Word Made Flesh. Um, By the way, Bolivia is in South America. (laughs) Just thought we should give a little note. I know when I was first invited, I was like, where is that? Is that in Europe somewhere? No, it's in South America. We even have a slide to show you where Bolivia is. It's landlocked between Brazil and Chile, so it is a place. Um, And so the first time that I was invited was because of this connection, because I, you know, have this handbag business and they saw that, you know, I do designs and things. They were looking for help for designs, um, with this ministry where what they do is they go into the brothels and they help the women and the prostitutes and their families uh, get out of that life and they have different programs for them. And one of the things that they can do is uh, make handbags as well down there, this company called Sutisana, which again is connected with Word Made Flesh. So uh, that's how the initial door opened in all they pretty much knew about me, I mean, I didn't know any of these people when I first went down, um, even the one that had connected me. I'd only talked to him on the phone a couple of times, but I went. And um, so the first time, all they knew is that I was pretty much coming down to do some designs, but that my real heart was to go and minister. I just wanted to get out in the brothels. I just wanted to pray for people and do outreach. So they had about half of my time there to help with the designs and to work, (laughs) and then the other half really to just do ministry. Well, um, that second half really just opened up. It was a beautiful, amazing time that was more than I I knew to ask for then. So they asked me to come back again. Well, they kept telling me I had an open um, invitation, and I would kind of made a pact with the Lord that, I would go anywhere and everywhere at the drop of a hat. You know, when the hurricanes are happening and you see all these things, I'm like, oh my God, I need to go there and help these people. So my deal with God was I have to have a direct invitation to go. That's how I, I know. I have to have that invitation. So when I got the invitation specifically to come again, um, I, I knew, of course, you know, prayed about and all that, but I knew that I was going back. 
and this time I really didn't know all of what was going to happen. Um, I will say that I was just open. I mean, they had asked me if, you know, if they could set up um, a service for me to do or um, set up different appointments with different maybe pastors or different things if I was willing to do that. And I just said, hey, I'm, I'm the Lord's service, you know, whatever it is that y'all want to set up, whatever it is that you want to do, I'm ready. Let's do it, you know, whatever that means. So the first night I got there, uh, flew a red eye, and then got there Thursday morning. And the first night, um, well, how many of you are familiar with the House, International House of Prayer IHOP? Cool. Most of you. Um, so there is a gal that runs um, the IHOP of Bolivia, she came and trained here in Kansas City and then opened it. The Lord sent her back to her home country in Bolivia and opened it up there. And uh, I had only met her once on my trip last year. She is friends with the executive director of the ministry that I was to have word made flesh that I was um, going to. And so they set it up where basically they started out with some worship and then just handed the service over to me which I thought was amazing because they really don't know me. <laughs> you want to talk about faith on their part, you know? <laughs> and it was incredible. I didn't know all. I knew, you know, Jesus said to do what? To go preach the gospel, right? Go preach the gospel. Then heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, and cast out devils. So I went. And I preached the gospel. I preached the word. I preached the truth for maybe like 15 minutes. And then I just opened it up and I said, whoever wants ministry, if you need a healing, if you want, need, you know, baptism of the Holy Spirit, whatever it is, then I will pray for you, you know, come up. I didn't know that everyone was going to stand up for prayer. <laughs> I had no idea. So um, I, where do you start? at number one, you know, so here we go with my translator because I don't speak a lick of Spanish and we just start praying and it was, can I tell you, absolutely incredible. About the first 20, I really just flowed. I mean, they didn't even have to tell me what they needed prayer for. Um, it was just the Holy Spirit leading, you know, whatever it was and um, it was amazing. But then after that, I was like, oh man, I think I better start asking them what they need prayer for. It was just a, such a pull. Um, so, yeah, I would just go up. What do you need prayer for? And about 75% of it was healings. But we saw a lot of baptisms of the Holy Spirit, you know, instantly speaking in tongues. That uh, was a prophetic word. If, if that's what someone needed, you know, if they're saying, oh, I just have a bitterness. I mean, the Lord was amazing. He was just moving so mightily. It, it was just flowing, you know. I would get, okay, then as soon as they would say, you know, oh, I just have this um, bitterness. I'm dealing with this depression or whatever. I mean, the Holy Spirit would just instantly give a word of knowledge and show exactly what needed to be dealt with. And then I'd pray them through that, you know. So it, I, you know what I really loved about that is because I felt like, um, in a sense, I got to experience a little bit of how Jesus walked. You know, Jesus didn't walk and say, okay, now I'm going to use the gift of prophecy. You know, okay, oh, this person needs healing. I better draw on this, the gift of healing for this person. No, he just walked. And as he went, whatever need was in front of him was provided. That's it. You know, when it, in 1 Corinthians, when it talks about the gifts, in the beginning of the chapter, when Paul is talking, he says, I do not want you to be ignorant Amen. of spiritual. Yep. We've added in the word gifts. Later on down, a couple verses down, he's talking about, then he's, okay, so that's, you know, when you write an essay, you start out with the overall what you're, what it's going to be about. That's his opening statement. Overall, I, the Church of Corinth, I don't want you to be ignorant in the things of the Spirit, basically, is how I'm going to paraphrase it. And then he goes on, and he starts to go into detail. Now, in the word, um, when he, the very first, well, the second gift word that we see in our translation typically is actually the word charisma. So he's saying, 
I don't want you to be ignorant in the spiritual gifts and this is what they, spiritual things, and this is what it is. It is the charisma. And the best way I know how, to, I'm not a theologian, I'm not a scholar, but the best way that I know how to explain what charisma is, is the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. So these are the different ways that we see the Holy Spirit manifested through us, the vessels, Christ's ambassadors on this earth. And it's all the exact same ways that we saw Christ walk in naturally. We just put pretty little labels on it. So sometimes it is prophecy. Sometimes it is healing. Sometimes it is tongues, interpretation, whatever it is, wisdom, knowledge, whatever it is. But please know that it's not just one thing. If you, if you move in one, you can move in all of them because the anointing that allows you to move in one, the Holy Spirit within you, is the same anointing you need to move in all of them. Paul says to earnestly desire the gifts, especially that of prophecy. Why? Because it lifts us up. But earnestly desire all of them, to use all of them. You know, the gifts are like a muscle. The more you use one, the stronger you're going to get in it. The more confident you're going to get in it, then the more you're going to move in it because you know and expect God to perform, right? To come through. You're not as worried. Oh, is this really going to happen? Does he really want to do this? Because you've seen him do it. But we can't be limited just on our experiences either. We've got to be willing to step out beyond our experiences and allow him to use us in ways that he's never used us before because he wants to do it. Trust me, he wants to. You're not waiting on anything to be poured out onto you. Nothing. There's nothing more. If you are a born-again Christian and the Holy Spirit is living inside of you, then you, there's nothing more God can do. He's done his part. Now it's up to us to step across that chicken line <laughs> and let's become an eagle. <laughs> uh, so praise God, I had some eagle experiences down in Bolivia. <laughs> um, and only, only by riding on the power of his Holy Spirit because that night, I can't even... Oh, man, I mean, I know, I, I can tell you a few things. I can't even remember all, all of what happened. I know that there was a man that um, had tumors growing all over his kidneys on both sides, and his stomach was protruded because of it, and he had severe back pain. And the doctors told him that there was nothing else that they could do for him, that it would basically be a very slow and miserable death. Well, we prayed, and um, the pain went away instantly, you know, Jesus, is, Jesus didn't have to be whipped. His skin did not have to be torn open where he was unrecognizable. He did that so that we can walk in complete healing. Do you realize that? Like He didn't have to go through all the scourging and all of the brutality that he did before being hung on the cross. It was not necessary for him to be the sacrifice on the cross for our sins. But he did it because Isaiah 53 tells us that by his stripes we are healed. So there is no reason why any of us should ever be in pain. Ever. Because we have all reason and authority to own complete healing. Because Christ already paid for it over 2,000 years ago. Right. Now, the devil, he doesn't really care whether he has authority or not. Remember, he's a thief, right? A thief doesn't ask to come into the house and to take your valuables. He just does it because he has ability. That's how the devil is. The devil has ability, so he's going to inflict pain and sickness and disease upon us. But Jesus has been given all authority. Amen. Do you know what that word in Greek all is? All. Yes. It's not very deep. It means all. None left out. Everything. Every little bit of authority 
has been given to Jesus. He was crucified, buried, and resurrected and appeared to his disciples. And he said, God has given all authority to me. Therefore, go in my name. So it is in the name of Jesus that we say, be healed. It is in the name of Jesus that we say, pain, go, disease, leave. It is in the name of Jesus that I commanded the tumors to go and leave this man for his whole body to be healed. The pain went. He started to feel his stomach go down a little. So I kept moving on. You can, I mean, there were, I don't know, 100, 150 people that first night. I don't really know. They told me I was up there for four hours. Um, so it was a while, you know, two minutes with, you know, I don't know, two, maybe two minutes a person. I don't really know, but for four hours. So you just calculate how many of that is. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so then I saw him again on Sunday morning at the church, and he came, and his stomach was completely normal, back to normal. He couldn't feel anything in it whatsoever. Yeah. Um, so that was the kickoff for my trip. So we go out. I go out to lunch uh, with one of the ladies. The, the next morning, I, I went. So I don't know how, let me explain a little bit how La Paz in Bolivia is. So at the peak of the mountains, it's in the Andes Mountains, it's about 14,000 um, feet above sea level. Down in the city is the more affluent area, um, and it is about 11,000 uh, feet above sea level. So to go from one and then to the peak where, the, the peak is where the, red light district is and the brothels and really just kind of the common folk live to be honest um, and so that's where I spent most of my time that's where I stayed um, and that's where the ministry center word made flesh is uh, so go up there uh, the next day and you know we're working on some designs and everything and super excited to be there and we go out to lunch and the lady who runs the business side of things Sutisana she asked me so what would you really like to see happen this trip? What do you really just want to see to feel like this is a successful, you've fulfilled whatever it was you came for? And I thought for a moment, I thought, oh my gosh, it's already done. <laughs> like I just saw and felt the love of God be poured out of me in such a vast and immense way. You know, for so long, it was just like, I'm, I'm good, you know, I think I could just get on the plane and go home, but um, that's certainly not what God had in mind, um, and I'm so glad, I'm so glad. Uh, so I ended up getting invited to preach at a church down there, a church of about a thousand, um, and the invitation came Saturday before the Sunday service, okay, so not a lot of time of warning there, but um, and the deal was that I had to do both services and that they both had to be the same. Well, if any of y'all know me, that's pretty difficult for me because <laughs> I just don't, I just kind of, you know, get up. I, this is my MO, right? Like I make sure that I get with Jesus. I get with Jesus. I get with my Papa God and then I'm just good to go. I get up here and then he just takes control and we flow, you know, so I was more nervous about trying to duplicate some sort of message or something than anything. I'm like, I can get up there and talk. That's not a problem, you know? And then we can minister. That's fine. You know, we got that covered. But um, fortunately, he, he came through. <laughs> so um, that's me in the center. That's actually at the church uh, where it says uh, the Dios which is God in Spanish. So that's at the church preaching. And then the one in the bottom um, left-hand corner there is at the church of us ministering afterwards. And then the two images in the top left and then um, kind of in the center right there is what's the first night praying for people. Um, so, 
yeah, I guess Thursday, they told me that Thursday was basically my test. So I guess I passed the test, or Jesus passed the test. And so I got to preach on Sunday. And it was so incredible, though. Can I tell you, like, these people were so hungry for whatever God was doing. And I felt such an honor to be able to stand before them and to share the word especially to share the prophetic word that God had given me um, on Saturday. You know, I was just having, actually, I was having a cup of coffee, that cup of coffee, um, and that's the symbol, word made flesh, that's their symbol on that coffee cup. So that's the view I had. And that is a very small um, of, I don't know, it's, it's, if you could span it out and make it panoramic, if you can imagine that, and that's just a very small clip of the whole panorama that I had. And um, the Andes Mountains, where those were, it's so beautiful because I was telling someone today that it's almost like if the Rockies met Sedona, Arizona. You know, so you have like these different pockets, you know, you have these orange rocky parts and then you have like the green trees. And um, that I was having a in the coffee and the sun was just beginning to settle and to go down and over to my left, I could see where the city was and the lights began to come on and they looked like little embers in the mountains. And so God spoke to me and he said, look out and what do you see? And I, I know when the Lord says something like that, you don't, you look with your physical eyes, but you don't really look with your, you look spiritually, you know, and um, so I'm looking in the spirit, and I say, well, they're, they're little embers. And he said, watch them. And they caught on fire. And just these big fires came about in, all over the city, just these little pockets all over. And he says, I want you to speak activation over my people. It is time for them to rise up. So he's, and then he told me to look to the right. And he said, what do you see? And I said, well, I see very dry and barren and that the people, you know, of course, I'm looking at a part of the mountains that seem very dry and barren. And, um, I, I, so I could see the pain and just the hardship that the people there of that place had endured. And God said, I'm bringing my rain. My rain is coming. And it was just so incredible. Um, I won't go into all of it, but to be able to stand in front of this amazing church of people that were so hungry for all that God had, some of whom had waited four hours to get prayed for, right? I mean, that's how many people in America really wait around for four hours to get prayed for? I don't know very many, I'm just saying. So, I mean, they were just so amazing wanting this and then to be able to, to speak this out over them and to call them forth and to say that it's time to rise up. This is what God is doing, that every spiritual blessing is for you. Every spiritual blessing is to be had for you um, was just such, just such an honor. And there was a lot of ministry, as you can imagine, um, after each service. Um, one, uh, well, total between those two, I probably saw at least a dozen blind eyes open. Um, and some of them, I mean, the people are coming and they're, I remember this elderly gentleman and he was just almost in tears because he wanted his eyes healed because he hadn't been able to read the word in three years and he missed it so much. He's like, I just want to read the word. I just want, so, um, you know, we're praying and, you know, sometimes it takes praying multiple times to break through. I mean, if Jesus had to pray for someone twice, it's okay if you have to pray a few times for someone to get the job done. You know, don't worry, it's okay. So it took quite a few times of praying for his eyes because it would get a little bit better, but, you know, we, we brought over a Bible and he couldn't quite get it clear, you know, and um, I just kept at it, even though there were... there. I did ask and make sure that there was a ministry team that could help me um, pray for, for people afterwards. I really was trying to lead on Thursday night all of my interpreters. You know, I intentionally had them um, in the end begin to put lay their hand and then speak forth. You know, my whole time while I'm there um, and even up here, the point of me being here isn't to tell you what 
God can do through me. It's to share what God does through a willing vessel. So if you're willing, then he can use you the same way. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm leading these people. And so really, although it was a prophetic activation kind of word that I gave on Sunday morning, it was laying a foundation of who we really are in Christ and the, really the command that all of us as Christians have. You know, if you ask me to pray for you and to give you a prophetic word of what your calling is, there is something that I can say to each one of you that is personal and that will be right on, no doubt. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils, and preach the gospel. That is a calling for every one of us that are born-again Christians. That is what all he wants all of us to do. So, um, you know, through that, I'm, I'm leading these people. So, oh, back to the guy with the eyes. But he, part of why it's really good to stop and pray for people multiple times, not just to get breakthrough and to see the healing, but it lets these people know that they're important. You know, how many people just don't feel like they're worthy? You know, oh, you pray for them a couple times. Oh, thanks. It's, it's okay. Thank you. You know, because they don't feel when they've got this whole line of people waiting behind him. And that's exactly what this older man is, is even though he was practically in tears wanting it, he was just like, it's okay. That's good enough, you know. And, and, I, and at least it's all being translated. I had a translator the whole time. So that's the gist of what I'm getting from him is he's just saying, it's okay, it's okay. And it's like, no, it's not okay. It's not okay. It's not okay that you think it's okay that I need to pass you by to get to all these other people. Sometimes just to keep praying with someone shows them that they are worthy, that they are loved, that Jesus loves them. He loves them so much. So ended up kept going. Um, yeah, and so it, it was amazing to see someone be able to read the Bible for the first time in a long time um, and to see that heart's desire come forth is beautiful. I uh, saw a gentleman be delivered that had, uh, he pulled out, he was pointing to a card in his front pocket um, and we pulled it out, and it was his disability card. And he had been disabled. He was a farmer and then couldn't farm anymore. And his legs um, were, like, crooked. Um, and he just had a hard time. He could not speak that well. And, uh, you know, so it was so beautiful just to see, you know, him delivered and to be able to walk again. Um, it's just so amazing to see families come together and then uh you know can you pray for my family and then you pray and the lord gives you a word and it just wrecks the whole family and then you're told later that oh man the dad's you know gone to be an alcoholic and you know all all this stuff and then you see him crying you know the dad is supposed to be so hard and cold cold and um just you know just beautiful just am amazing things that happen and um I mean, you see a lot of people back straightening up. I mean, I could go on and on and, and on with, you know, what, what healings took place. I mean, again, honest, so many, I don't even remember all of them. Um, but one thing that I, I want to share with you is that whenever I pray for someone to be healed, I don't actually pray at all. The only praying I really do is to just thank God. I don't know why I just always thank God first because I know he's going to do it. I know he's going to do it. You know, and maybe I thank him for that person. But then I command it in the name of Jesus, whatever to happen. You know, sometimes um, we, it's like we beg God and plead to God to heal somebody. But if we really look at it, it's what that's like would be like asking your boss to come and do your job for you because he's given us all that we need to do it and told us to go and do it. 
So we always command it in Jesus' name, whatever needs to be done. Um, and then we thank the Father for that. So throughout the week, um, began just really working in the mornings. I would be with uh, the design team and working on new product development. And I love those ladies. Every lady that works and that sews in that little factory has been rescued um, off of the streets and out of the brothels. And to see them, there's this one, um, her name's Sylvia. And to see the joy on her face and to see how proud she is, you know, when you show her, when the shop manager shows her um, a prototype and gives her a basic pattern and then to see her complete it and make it and to bring it to you, you know, and it just, the love of God that emanates from them because of the freedom that they've received is so, it's really just exhilarating to be around them. It's hard to get around that and then not want to go and do more for the Lord, not want to run out immediately to the brothels and then just preach, you know, to these women and to just love on them. Um, which is actually something we got to do Thursday night, which I love. It's one of my most favorite times is when we go out into the streets at night. And what it is is there's just an alley that of these doors. It's just um, like cement or stone buildings, and there's just these metal doors. And during the day, they don't look open. It looks like nothing. It looks like it's just a bunch of back doors to maybe businesses on the other side. But at night, as soon as the sun goes down, you actually have street vendors that come out and start selling beer and um, different little pastries. And they have public restrooms that open that you pay to use. And, um, you know, then you start to see these, these lights through these metal, all the metal doors open. And just a sea of men just walking around and everywhere. And um, actually, the smell of urine is just rampant there. Um, as the gentlemen, they just go and relieve themselves on the streets before they go in uh, to the brothels, and it's it's very interesting. But the awesome thing is that I feel so comfortable there because I know God. When God calls you to do something, and you know He's with you, it's like being at home in a way. You know, it's it just amazes me how comfortable is it's it's like walking in here you know like I walk into a brothel like I own the place you know I mean, it's just like walking in here I just know that God is with me I know that he's going to do something that he's going to speak to one of those girls that he's going to heal somebody there that someone's going to get to see Jesus there and experience the God of the universe personally one-on-one -on -one. if we'll just go and step out he'll protect you it doesn't matter how dangerous the place is, if there's bullets flying, if there's drug dealers. And if God's called you to go there, he'll protect you. He's got his angels around you. You're going there for a purpose. Remember, the scripture says that we have been ordained to do good works that he chose for us before the foundation of the world. Individually, each one of us has works that we are to do here on this earth. If that's what he's called you to do, I admonish you, go. Go. He will show up. Don't doubt. Just go. Um, we went in to this one brothel that, uh, well, the director, you pair up and go two by two. And um, she was with me and she's just like, wherever the spirit's taking you, um, no pressure there. But so we go into this one brothel and I'm walking around and um, the Lord highlights this lady that is sitting in the center. Now, so you go in and basically what it is, is it's a building with a bunch of doors on the exterior walls. And then um, there's the doors are to these little rooms where the girls are. Um, so the men walk up to the doors that are kind of cracked open and then um, negotiate. And if, you know, they think they're worth what they're negotiating, then they go in. If not, then they move on. So that's basically what we do. We walk up to these doors and we just start talking to these girls and um, ask them if they need any sort of healing or um, if they need prayer for anything. Um, the executive director, she may talk to them about, you know, that 
there's it's the House of Hope. So they may she may invite them to the House of Hope, whatever it is uh, that you know we feel on our heart to do. Uh, but in this particular case, I was led to this lady that was just sitting in the center of this brothel, um, and Andrea, the lady I was with, knew her. And I'm like, well, you know, I, we're supposed to talk to her. And so it ended up she had been really sick and had pain all over her body and tingling. And um, she didn't want me to pray for her. And she actually, her and Andrea, I don't know what they were talking about. They were talking Spanish. I don't speak Spanish. But they were just talking. And then so we she's like, let's step outside. And I'm thinking, oh, good, I'm going to get to pray for her. So I ask again. She doesn't want prayer. And then they just kept talking and talking and talking and then here I am and it was like the second place we went and I'm like you know I'd really like to go pray for some more people and I'm just like Lord come on now and he said this is why I brought you here was for her it's like oh okay this is why we're here for her and um it ended up whatever the end of their conversation was um you know the the Lord just gave me a, a quick word for her and how he saw her and something about what had happened to her when she was a little girl and um, you know it, you could tell it really touched her and then I asked her one more time if I could pray for her physically you know to be healed and um, she did and so for three days she had had complete body just tingling and pain all over her body and on and off massive migraines and wasn't sure what was going on and they had done some blood work and was waiting on that to come back and instantly she said she could feel cold rush through her body she said it started in the top of her head and then it's just like it pushed through her body until all of the pain and all of the tingling just went out the bottom of her feet and you know it's reasons like that I mean that is the kingdom of God coming near right that is it right there and to be able to look someone in the eyes and say, Jesus just healed you because he loves you. You know, it's incredible. It's what we're here for. Because we are ambassadors of Christ. We are the righteousness of God here for him. Not just the pastor at the pulpit. Not just the prophet that you hear on YouTube. You, and you, and you, and you, and you, every one of you. Mm. Know nothing but Christ and him crucified, not with the persuasive words, but with the demonstration of spirit and of power. You know, we love that scripture and don't we pray all the time to have an acts 2 experience where 3,000 more get saved in one day in one setting but do you know how it happened it wasn't just with persuasive words Peter didn't just get up and start preaching there was a demonstration a manifestation of the power of God and it can be in so many different ways. I move a lot through prophetic words and healing and words of knowledge because that's just what I've asked for. That's what I've sought after. That's what I've gone after. That's what I've practiced. That's what I've yearned for, right? That's what I do all the time. But it could be tongues. We see that in Acts 2, they were all speaking in different tongues, and the people were amazed. That was the manifestation of the Spirit. That's what OJ is talking about when he says, do not limit God. Do not limit God in how he wants to move through us. So um, I want to share another testimony with you that is really probably my most favorite one out of the whole trip. Bolivians are extremely private people. So for them to open up to you is amazing, but then to be invited into their home is like a whole nother level. Um, so I got invited, actually got invited in, to have dinner with two Bolivian families, but only made it to one. 
and the my sweet sweet hostess Kara she was so awesome she was so jealous because she's been there for a year and hasn't been invited a single time to anyone's home and I got invited twice but um, it was only by the grace and favor of God so I go to this family and on my way there, on, we're taking um, public transportation, and she's talking to me in kind of broken English, but in the best she can. And she tells me this story about the hardships of her family and how she's one of five kids, and she only has one brother. And the brother, when he was three, um, contracted tuberculosis and for the last 17 years hasn't been able to walk more than about 10 feet of which he can only do with um, legs full of braces and a cane, completely blind in one eye, legally blind in another eye. His hands are just, you know, um, deformed um, and his speech isn't very good. Uh, but mentally he's pretty sharp, he's pretty with it, but he has all of these physical just I don't know, restrictions, if you will, um, and how there in Bolivia, there's a word that they call um, machismo, which um, is very similar to if we think of like macho, a man, and it's extremely important for that culture that there is a man in the family, in the household. If there is not, the family is looked down upon and shunned in that culture. So when their father who was a pastor of a church, got sick and passed away when the kids are young and they have this disabled little boy, their machismo left the family. The church turned their back on them. They had no money coming in. The one male in the house is really more of a hindrance than a help. They went many nights without any food whatsoever. Carrots were cheap. So if they were still hungry, the mom would say, go get another carrot. If when they were out of carrots, she would say, go read, go do your studies, which she did not know how to read and had taught herself how to read later on. And all of her kids became successful and, and you know, had good jobs and just so to be invited in this family, to be able to have um, dinner with them, it was just so amazing. And you walk in and um, the center of their house is basically open and has no roof. And then you just have um, these different rooms, um, you know, one's like a kitchen and you have like a bathroom and a bedroom and that kind of thing. So we go in and um, beginning to meet, you know, the sisters and the nieces and um, then the brother comes in and um, so, of course, we wanted to pray. Well, the, one of the sisters had just had, had surgery three months prior, and she had her gallbladder taken out, and there were complications. So she had been in severe pain and um, only been able to eat about half the foods that she could typically eat. So immediately prayed for her, and then she was healed and was able to have a normal dinner with us that night, and it was wonderful. And um, wanted to pray for the brother, and uh, it, it was incredible, I mean, to see this man, um, again, very, very private people. So, you know, as, as I'm praying, he's just not quite sure what to do with himself, you know. Um, here's this gringa just popping in here and, hey, let's just, you know, heal your whole family. But uh, so ended up at the end of the night, you know, it took, again, this is one of those times where you just, I just didn't let up. I just didn't let up. I kept praying. We would see some results and I would keep praying and I would keep praying. And the first thing I prayed for was his legs and he would be able to um, walk, you know, quite back and forth a few times, which was probably about seven or eight feet away without the cane, right? Which was amazing because he couldn't walk about 10 feet without the cane and the braces. So the fact that he's going back and forth a few times without the cane is they're like oh my gosh they're in amazement and I'm going this is not enough you know so we kept praying and then I realized because I could feel his legs being strengthened as I'm commanding the healing immediately so I realized that the braces were no longer helping him they were a hindrance 
So I'm like, we need to take the braces off. So they go in the other room, they take the braces off, and he comes back. And then I realized that he hasn't walked in 17 years like a normal person. He did not know to go heel, toe, heel, toe, heel, toe. So it was okay, now we have, tell him how to walk. I, you know, I'm having her translate. I'm like, tell, tell, tell him how to walk. So the rest of the night, he just kept walk back and forth, heel, toe. He, you could almost see him thinking about what he was doing, you know, just trying to retrain his muscles that, you know, had basically been drug around, you know, for 17 years. And it was awesome. And half the family, like, I think they were just in utter shock and didn't know what to do. So it's like they were zoning out. And then the other half were like praising Jesus and hallelujah. And we're super excited. It was interesting um, reactions there, mix of reactions. But then we prayed for his eyes. And um, we first prayed for the, the one eye. And we just prayed, probably took about four or five times. And um, because he would be able to see, you know, he'd be able to see finally he could see but it was blurry out of the blind eye and then he'd be able to see distance so I'd bring something up close but he couldn't see up close so we pray again and he can see up close and we pray for the other eye for complete clarity so this man that had been bound for 17 years can now walk and see we pray for his hand <laughs> yes hallelujah immediately one prayer boom his hand opens up and he has strength you know, so God is doing things now. God is doing it now. He's doing the miraculous. And I do want to tell you that as you go out and you start to pray for people, um, I always expect and want that it be an instantaneous, miraculous healing right there on the spot. But there are times, um, especially with um, sometimes like, bones and physical, you know, bone restructuring or tumors going down that sometimes it takes a little bit of time. Just because you don't see it instant doesn't mean it's not happening. Right. The word says that we will lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. It doesn't say you're always going to see a miraculous instantaneous healing every single time. So don't walk away disappointed. <laughs> there's those times to press through, but then there's those times to stand and stand on faith and to stand on the word of God. There were times, well, almost after every, every day, at the end of the day, I would thank God for the things that I had seen him do. But if there was maybe uh, one where I didn't see it to the level that I knew it should have been, I remind God of his word. I say, God, this is what your word says, that it, by Jesus' stripes we are healed. You commanded me to go and do this. I laid my hands on this person. You said that they shall recover. Now finish the work. I pray for complete healing and wholeness. It's okay, I mean, to go and, and to intercede and expect that. God says, remind him of his word. Remind him of his promises. There's nothing wrong with that. Nothing at all. Remember, it's like a muscle. It's something that you build. You've got to continue praying or prophesying or speaking in tongues. Whatever it is that however you want the Lord to use you, whether it could be just preaching the gospel, it's just practicing. It's doing it over and over and over again and building that muscle for you to get stronger. Then you're going to see it more and more and more and more and more results and quicker as well. Um, you know, I do want to share why I believe the Lord has shown me that all of these miraculous things, which I've only touched on a fraction of, happened while I was down there. And um, I pray for, you know, actually Impact has already seen a lot of healings. I, I'm looking at people here that I know either I've prayed for or someone here at Impact, and they could give you a testimony of healing. Um, we have amazing healings in our own family. Um, it's, it's happening. It's not just for overseas. It is for the United States. It is for here. It is for now. But I want to share with you why I really believe in, in my heart, why I see these things and why God moves so mightily. And it just blew me away down there. Um, it's because I'm just willing. And uh, Nathan actually prophesied that over me 
after I had just been asked that question, someone asked, a friend of mine asked to take me out to lunch the week after I got back because she wanted to hear about my trip and all that took place. And um, I, at first I couldn't even talk about it. I was like, it was just beyond what I would have ever have known to pray and ask for. You know, even now it's hard to articulate and to share all of what really happened. Um, and she asked me why. Why? after how amazing it was in 2017, why so much more? Why the expanse? Why, you know, just the multiplication, the exponential uh, experiences of the supernatural? Why? And it took me a second, and I thought on it, and I knew the answer in my spirit was because I was willing. And I have to share with you that, yes, I was willing there are probably not a lot of people that would stand up and is willing to stay four hours and pray for every last person. I would have stayed up there 12 hours if that many people were there and that many people had waited for prayer. And I did that in multiple services. I, I was really, they were amazed at how much I went because from dawn up pretty much till dusk, I was on. I was there to serve the Lord's people. I was his vessel. And if someone wanted ministry, then I was willing to do it regardless. And, um, I mean, they were like, wow, you haven't wasted any time. Even the last night, I had to get up at 3 o'clock the next morning to catch a 5 a.m. flight. And there were a multitude of people that kept reaching out that couldn't get to me throughout the week and um, that really wanted prayer and wanted to send this person to me or that person to me to pray for them and um, so they left my Friday night open knowing that I would have to get up super early. And so Thursday afternoon, I realized that there are so many people that have reached out that need ministry that we haven't gotten to. So I told them, if y'all are willing to open up the building, then I will do a service and I'll pray for whoever needs it. And they did. And it was just word of mouth less than 24 hours later. When I got up to pray for people, I would guess maybe at least 50 were there, but then more kept coming, so I don't know. But so you see, it's just because I was willing. I was just willing. And I have to tell you, though, that that willingness didn't start when I said yes to get on a plane to go to Bolivia. That willingness started a while ago when I looked at the word and read that we were to heal the sick, and I wasn't seeing it happen. I was seeing the Spirit of God move in so many amazing ways, and prophecies and deliverances, just so many amazing ways, right? But I wasn't seeing healings. And I would ask why, and I'd get answers why, and, um, I, but I, wouldn't, I wasn't pleased with it. I wanted to see it. I wanted to see God move. It was a promise that I saw in the Word, that was for us and I wanted hold of it. So I was willing to dig in. I was willing to have faith when a lot of people around me didn't have faith. I was willing when I kept hitting the walls because let me tell you something. When you start going out there and you go after whatever it is that you're going after, like for me it was healing, you're going to hit some walls because you're now a big threat to the enemy and he doesn't want you to get good at this. Especially, I was sharing with um, Naomi something that I had heard here recently, and someone was sharing that if all you do is pray for Christians, and you're brand new at praying, then you're probably going to come up against a lot of walls and get really frustrated. Why? Because Christians are a threat to the enemy. You're going to come up with more spiritual resistance praying for people in the church than you may for someone who's not a threat to the enemy out in the streets. You know, so get out there. Get out there and go and pray for the lost. It is, um, it is awesome when you see somebody get healed and they don't know what happened and they're like, what are you? What just happened? What power is that? You know, and they start listening to all you and you're like, no, nope, it's Jesus. And he healed you because he loves you. You know, it is it is so amazing. I dare you. Go try it. It's a lot of fun. But, and I mean, they don't know you. Don't worry about what's going to happen or, 
or you know what they're going to think of you. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Um, but the the devil doesn't like that. It's not always easy. And I press through when I came up against those walls. When let me tell you, I have prayed for family members that were on their deathbed that I knew were not supposed to die. It was not their time, and they died. Now, does that mean that I just give up and say, well, God, I guess that just, that was your will? No, no. You keep pressing on, and you keep keeping on. You've got to let resistance build you up and be your fuel. Don't let resistance take you down because then the enemy has won. You've got to let resistance just put a fire inside of you to want it even more. So it's because I was willing in those very difficult and hard times in the beginning to press on and to keep on why I saw so many miraculous things happen in Bolivia. I'll tell you, just for Bolivia, it is right here and right now and for tonight. And we are going to minister tonight and we are going to see healings and uh, it's going to be absolutely amazing. So if anyone here um, has any physical, um, OJ, this is where you're, okay. <laughs> If anyone here um, needs any sort of physical healing, then um, I'd like for you to come up here. But it's not just, remember, it's not just about me. I have no special gift. I have no special anointing. I'm just a born-again Christian that's gone after the truth and that lives out the word. That's it. It's as simple as that. So, um, you know, if you're a minister here, then I'd like for you to come forward now would be good and then for whoever so oj james naomi whoever needs um a healing then please come up um can we put on some music